I'm impressed uh, for this morning to share something very, very personal with you. It's not a completed task. It is a uh, work in progress. So I will not be able to put correct conclusions to everything that I'm going to share with you, but I can sense the direction of my spirit beginning to lean towards a certain way. It, and it will be important for you as a congregation to understand my, my head space. Hello? To understand where I am so that we can move together in a certain direction. I want us to share some few things on the issue of worship. Amen. On? One more time. Worship. And I want to categorically state at the very onset that maybe this is what life is all about. Maybe this is what it is all about. Everything else is secondary. What is primary is worship. Worship not as a venue, but worship as an experience. What prompted me was a book that I'm reading. I'm reading weird books this time. Weird books. If I show you my library now, you're going to faint. I'm reading this book by Woodford where he's stating his relationship with uh, Obongo Homa, which is this uh, traditional healing. And he says in this book, I know when my ancestors are here. I can feel them. They know how I feel about them. And I know also how they feel about me. And I think about them all the time. And I work with them. I put the book aside a little bit and I folded my hands and I said, can a Christian say, I know God is here with me. I feel him with me. No, let me, let me quickly put a disclaimer clause on the issue of feelings. People say don't bring feelings to church. As if feelings were created by the devil and uh, they don't belong to worship. Don't, don't make it emotional. It, 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 this dualistic Greek Hellenistic thinking is not correct, which divides people into segments of removing themselves from a situation. So don't, don't make it personal. No, no. For me, everything is personal. Because you cannot get me angry and then say, don't, don't make it personal. I don't know which part of me you want to deal with. It's almost like you're telling me, no, remove your mind from it. Remove your emotions from it. Remove. How can I remove my emotions from it? If I'm emotionally affected by what you're saying and you're telling me not to get emotional, then what do you want to deal with? Human being is holistic. When you're talking to me, you're not talking to my mind only. You're talking to the total sum of me. I see you. That's, I hear you. I feel you, I smell you, I think you, I listen to you. You are, you, are, you, are, you are getting the whole of me involved in your conversation. Depending what type of news you are giving me, if you walk, look at me and say, your brother is dead. By the time that news reaches me, it does things to me. It begins to evoke a certain amount. When you look at me and you see me beginning to cry, why are you worried? Because words have gone into me. And they, they have capacity to run into my system and unlock emotions and other things wherever they are. And I will react to what you are saying based on how it is coming to me. Now, it would be very wrong for you to say to me, don't be emotional. Don't cry. What are you dealing with here? And, and I looked at this comment and my heart leaped. Because for once I discovered that Christianity is fake. I'll qualify why I'm saying that. It is fake as we are practicing it now. Because it is a Christless experience. It is an emotionless experience. It is a spiritless. Hear the English. It's a spiritless experience. Come with me. The Christianity that we have right now 
it has become a dogmatic intellectual celebration where we call people and ask them, do you believe in the Sabbath? Do you believe in the second coming of Jesus? Do you believe that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Do you believe? In other words, we cluster these beliefs and people are supposed to have a relationship with beliefs. People are supposed to gather the 27 or 26 or 22, I don't know how many there are, or 30 beliefs, and then put them around and say, lift up your hand if you believe this. So we write them on a piece of paper and we give you a piece of paper and say, now raise your hand. Do you? Yes, I do. Next one. Yes, I do. And someone at the end of agreeing with those doctrines, by no ways have they admitted and agreed that they become an agent of spiritual occupation. Witchcraft takes nine, nine months under the water. Three years to four years of training for you to finally become a, a witch doctor. Ask me why they are doing that. They are developing the language of the spirit. Some of you who are younger in, in, in learning, I will tell you why. If you want to know the game, if you want to know the war, you also need to know the enemy. There are two levels. If not three, those were here last night. Let's go together. There are three levels of life. Level number one is the level of materials. Come on. Level of benches, chairs, glasses, cars, and food. And many of us are stuck in the world of buying things and eating things. We want to see them, we want to touch them. We live to gather and accumulate materials. And we think that by having materials, our lives will become better. But around the whole world, people who commit suicide are not only poor people. In fact, it has been proved that rich people commit more suicide than poor people. Because in the abundance of materials, there is emptiness of quality. You begin to have a relationship with cars, with clothes, with glasses. And what? And when you find someone, they've smashed your car or they've stolen your expensive 5,000 pair of glasses, your high blood pressure shoots through the sky. And you are worried about material to such an extent that you reduce the quality of your life because your materials are now part of you. You cannot be separated from your things. If right now your car smashes, some people will end up in hospital also. But you're okay. You're okay, son. You're okay. You're okay. So the fact that material has disappeared from you, has your life disappeared? If the house is repossessed, for example, but you're alive, you're not repossessed. If you have lost your job, yes, but you're alive. For you to, to bundle life with things makes life more complicated. Because no matter how many things you have, you can never take those things inside yourself. They remain as external. Come on, guys. They remain as, in fact, you are as rich as your birthday suit. Naked I came. Naked I go. Everything else that you try to put around yourself to cover up, smell and what, and all these things. Some of us are a mobile wardrobe. By the time we leave the house, we are weighing 5, 10 kgs more of things that we just to cover up the things. No matter how much materials you gather in yourself, you can never be the same quality with your materials. It remains as an external business. A useless and fruitless life of gathering things. The Bible says God has placed it as one of his torturing methods to allow wicked people to gather lots of things only to hand them over to those that love the Lord. World number two is the world of the mind. Come with me. Let's go together. The world of? The world of the mind, it is an intellectual space where we make decisions and we make these decisions sometimes based on our influences of our senses and making assessments. And the best way of thinking is observation. 
As you learn life, as you see things happen, you begin to formulate certain principles about how things function. It's almost like a semi-scientific sort of world where black is black, red is red, and etc. And we're thinking and we're hoping that by managing our software, our hardware will perform in a certain way. If you are with me. By managing your software, you can control your hardware, can you? Now you can hear what I'm saying, is it? You don't want your hardware to control your your software, then there becomes a very big problem. You, then you, 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 you're running around with your hardware ev- everywhere look, looking for you know, vandalizing stuff. But the mind becomes the center which is processing the activities that are happening in the body. A very intelligent space where people formulate things, but I have bad news for you. The fact that you are convinced about something, facts don't change people. Come with me. Facts. Don't change. A whole doctor, a neurosurgeon, a heart surgeon, sitting at the corner of a surgery, having finished to operate someone who had liver cirrhosis, someone who had cancer of the lungs from tuberculosis and smoking and everything else, he would take a smoke break. You know, the day in Cartel, man. He is actually in the surgery. He knows exactly what this thing does. But he will go outside to go and get a smoke. I can't translate that to a Christian experience because I will traumatize you. Because right now, all of us, if we are that doctor, if we are supposed to spin the whole thing and make it a sin business, none amongst us needs to be taught anything. So the fact that we know it does not mean that we do it. The fact that we know it does not mean that we live it. It's just a bunch of notes, information that is clogged in the minds of people. And people think that by knowing more, they become better. (laughs) We have actually known more and done far much less. In the midst of knowledge, there is gross ignorance. Because true knowledge is experience. Are we on the same page, guys? True knowledge is? So, wealth number one, you get materials. Wealth number two, you think how you are going to get those materials. So, you formulate methods, formulas, and what and what to run. But even with all the information given to you, the quality of your life most likely will not change. I must submit to you that our governments are working on wealth number one. Our educational institutions are working at world number two, but partially. They introduce us to formulas of slavery rather than formulas of success. Ask me why I say that. You can go and do an MBA tomorrow morning. Until you finish MBA, they'll never show you how to open your own company. MBA. Master of Business and administration. And you graduate there with magma summa cum laude, golden strips and what and what around your neck. And still you don't know how to go to Cyprus and open a company. Kuna wafana wase mami lodi, laba wanga fundanga na kufunda, uzo kushaya, uzo kushaya la yonge lento, at 10 minutes, ta 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 ta, bambala, bambala, bambala. Because our institutions have never been interested in making you what you must be, rather than you working where I want you to work. Therefore, we have an industry of manufacturing slaves. We are educated in working for other people, not working for ourselves. And many of us are very good when it comes to working for others. Except when you say, whatever you're doing for Mulungu, do for yourself. It's a shiban. Oh, but give him an office, give him a desk, give him a telephone, and it's someone's company. You take that company to the clouds, to the moon. Strategy this, what function this, what, what, and now do it for yourself. Lights out. Why? Because in your entire life, you have never been told that you are a factory that can function by itself. You are fully capacitated to employ yourself. 
That's why six years ago, those of you who have been watching, six years ago, when now I was re reformatting my Facebook page, they said, where do you work? I said, Maponga J. I work at this factory. Kina kitweremmo. Ndim and pete. Up. Kwam up. Sebenza mna up. There's batala up. Kuma up. I do. I do me. If there's English like that. You don't need to hire. You, you don't need to hire me. When you hire me, it's with my permission. And most of the times these days, because I know slightly what I'm worth. May cost you. Not a little bit. May cost you. A little bit more than you thought. Because it's me coming with my time, with my everything to enhance your factory and your industry. And so, I no longer do small things. I'm not interested. There are small people who do small things. I don't do small things. Because I don't want to get my factory involved in small business. So it's not my problem. But listen, I write my own policies. It's my industry. You got a problem with that? It's my logo. It's my logo. It's my life. Yes, tell me also in Cut yours. And West in Namate, the Lagum in Namate. Now you look at me, and all of a sudden you have extra hours. You want to employ yourself to, to supervise me also and make me look the way you want me to look. Man, go hire yourself. When I need your services, I'll call you. <laughs> the world of the mind is such a torturous world. Because why? We have been taught what to become. We have not been taught to be. You didn't hear me? Can I say that slowly? We have been told and taught what to become a doctor, become an engineer, become an accountant, become this. And for you to become that, then you must do this and this and this to become that. And how many of us, after we've become whatever they say we must become, are happy with what we became? Then how come you're a teacher and you're busy doing construction? What's happening? How come you are, you are a lawyer and you're working in a spasa shop? Exactly. Tell me one person who is here who is qualified in their job and they're working in their job. Half the times we go to school and after we've finished learning, we start to discover we are not happy with what we have become. Let me not waste too much time on the intellectual world. The intellectual world is just introducing you to other people's foolishness and how to memorize it and also look educated. So when you are writing a dissertation, they don't want to know what you think. They want to know how much you know about what others think. Come on, guys. I'm not, a, I'm not an intellectual weakling, so I'll share that with you. That's why we talk the most critical part of writing a dissertation is citation. Dissertation is citation. You need to learn how to do footnotes and end notes and quote other people, please, and put brackets. And after we have quoted the ones we think that they are good enough, then we look at you and say, now you are educated. Not that you have contributed anything useful, but simply you are reflecting other people's thoughts and say, now I also know what is, what's happening. I mean, I've not read. Then I went to school to study music so that I can play with him. I can't read all those knob carries. I took tap prints for some time to teach me how to do music. And he would sit around there, you know, ah, there's a crochet, there's a quiver. And I'm looking at all those knob carries and I'm wondering, when am I going to, when am I going to start playing? When am I going to start playing? <laughs> Because ultimately, it's not in the memorizing of those sticks. Now nah, I want to play. I want to play. So I hang around with those who know how to read. They, 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 they. But ultimately, it's the experience itself. World number two is the world of the mind. And the world of the mind is the world where you are taught limitations. You're taught? You can't do that. You can't do that. And where I work now in the music space, 
you are, no, you can't do that. Who says I can't? But I've just done it. <laughs> Who says you, 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 no, you, you are coming from this court, then you must move to this court, and you must resolve on this court. Oh, that's the way they teach you in class. But, but I can do the other way around. <laughs> Who says music starts at one? Why not start at four? Why not five? Why not six? Why not on a seven minor? And why not end on an eighth? Who cares after all? But school then tells you you can't. When I was doing painting, no, when you are painting, you must start like this. You must prime, then what? Hey, don't waste my time. I just took that paint and I painted. 300 paintings later, I'm looking, I'm saying, wow, good job, Maponga J. Good job. How did you do that? I don't know. <laughs> but it's done. It's done. In case you don't believe it, here it is. World number two, which is the world of the mind. People are being educated. And by being educated, people are being punctuated to be limited. People are being told how to tow the line of civilized sanity. You are being sanitized to become slightly Eurocentric so that you can be functional globally. Painful. World number three, the world of the spirit. Come with me. <laughs> world number one is the world of? Come on, let's go together. Let's go together. World of? And world number two is the world of the mind. World number three is the world of the spirit. Come on, let me talk like a preacher. The whole purpose of the Bible is not for us to memorize doctrines, but to live spiritual lives. It has been converted into a tool of managing people rather than empowering people. When you look throughout your Bible, you don't read the normality of life. You, leave, you read the supernatural nature of life when in congruence with God. I'm speaking too much English. Let me break it down. The Bible introduces the human being to himself. Firstly, by creation. Supernatural. The whole idea of a human being being alive is not physical, material. It's not mental. It is spiritual. Because a lump of flesh that is lying on the dust of the earth has no life until God breathes into that life. You cannot say life is oxygen. People die with oxygen masks on their faces. Therefore, life is not oxygen. You are not alive because you breathe. You are alive because God has placed his spirit in you. Our genesis of life is not intellectual. It's not material. It is spiritual. To live life therefore in the first two worlds is to live a primitive life. The real life is on stage number three. Come with me. Stage number three, we are in the spiritual space. What happens in the spiritual space? In the spiritual space, the human body becomes spiritual. It's a venue of constant interaction with the other. It is no longer about you carrying your body, walking around a lump of flesh, caressing the face of the earth. It's about you being a container of bigger substance than yourself. World number three is where I want to push you to. I know you're not comfortable, but let me try. In this world of the spirit, there are no limitations. In witchcraft, you spend nine months under the water being trained with no mask on your face. But that's where we all started in your mother's womb. Nine months busy swimming in water. (laughs) 
No, man, you are educated. You are educated. And I hope if I can appeal a little bit to your mental world, then you can come to the spiritual world. That actually, before you were born, you were, you were, you are not, you are not natural. You are supernatural. Because right now, take a human being and put him in the water. Now. You, some things will happen to you. But it does not mean that you can't do it. Because that's where you started. It's a science which science does not want to teach us. Because if we knew how to do that, then it means that we can actually live under the water. I'm asking you. So a human being is like a fish in their early infants. Because then they are pulling oxygen from the water that is around the mother's womb. The umbilical cord is not in the nose. <laughs> it's here just for food and other things. But the whole issue of oxygen and what and what, it has nothing to do with the nose can pull, can work. You are not natural. If it will take me time to convince you, you are not coming from a natural space. You are actually coming from a supernatural space. I'll give you another one. The Indians do their trances. And then they take knives and poke each other. And then they hang things on their bodies as they are dancing in those trances. Under the radiology, they put those Indians guys. And as they are dancing, there begins to be like a line of uh, energy around them. You know, like when you're looking on a car that is hot on a hot day. And there is that thing... It like like that thing you know what I'm talking about like a mirage it begins to circle around the person and the more they're getting into the trance the line gets thicker and gets thicker and gets thicker now when you take a knife and you poke the person the energy that is around them curves with the knife goes through the human flesh to the other side without destroying the flesh itself. You can hang whatever you want to hang on the person. The person will dance throughout the whole ceremony. When the ceremony is finished, you come back to the person and pull out the knives, pull out the wires that you have put, and flesh comes to back together and it leaves no wound. You didn't hear me. Because it can show us that the human body, when subjected to the spirit, the body itself and flesh transforms itself into another form that is not natural. Then you can walk on coals of fire. You walk that way and you walk that way and the fire is burning and you will not even burn an inch. You're not listening to me, guys. The human body has capacity to move beyond natural to become supernatural. Now you are ready for me to talk the Bible. How do you open the Red Sea? How do you speak to supernatural performances and move the natural elements out of their way? How do you open up the ground and swallow people? How do you become a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day? And it's visible. It's here. Someone did not hear me out there. How do you say like Elijah, it will not rain until I speak again? How does nature listen to the human voice? You guys are not with me. You're not with me here. How do you put three boys in a burning furnace? And they walk around the furnace and the fire don't touch them at all. How do you do that? How do you walk on the water? How do you break bread? How do you... Do? Look to how to walk up to a dead person and say Talitako. How do you stand at a grave and say Lazarus? So come, come. Come, come here. How do you, Philip, you are busy conducting a service in Jerusalem? And an Ethiopian eunuch is about to enter into his own country. Hundreds of kilometers away. 
And the Lord says, we have some business to do. At the borders of Ethiopia. Philip, has he? You think which doctors do what is new? They fly in the night on broomsticks. Oh, come on. In the world of the spirit, Philip himself. Then he's a witch doctor also. Because from Jerusalem, where he was conducting a service, the Lord transported him right across into Ethiopia. The Ethiopian man is sitting on his chariot. There's a man sitting next to him. Do you understand what you are reading, sir? No, how can I understand until someone tells me what it's all about? Amen. Jesus died. He was resurrected from the dead. And on earth, the man is getting said, hey, Amen. Here is the water. Here is the pastor. What can stop me from being baptized? Stop. Stop. They stop. They go into the water. Philip baptizes the man. When he finishes baptizing him, push. Philip is back in the vestry in Jerusalem where he was preaching. I thought, I thought the Bible was about understanding the second coming of Jesus. I thought it was about teaching us how to tithe, teaching us how to eat and etc. Ladies and gentlemen, the disciples are meeting in the upper room and the Bible then says, and Jesus just walked through the wall. And he was in their midst. Hello, somebody. He was in their midst. He says, no, but you are a ghost. You are a ghost. Who will not believe? He says, no, ghost, don't eat. Give me some fish. Give me something to eat. No, this is, it can't be. He says, Zogala, come, put your hand right here. Puts his hand and comes out with the blood. It's me. It's not a ghost. But in my physical state, I can hold, I can eat, I can touch. But I can walk through the walls. Someone is not with me here, guys. I am saying, when you say in the Bible that you want to be like Jesus. I'm asking you. You said you, you want to be like Jesus. But you can't even operate at the level of witchcraft. You, you, can't, you can't live a life above food later on to be educated ultimately to be spiritual you are struggling with salaries struggling with rent struggling on ground floor with these things that even animals are struggling for also you are you are struggling with them because in world number two good knowledge is a shelter to the one who has it but it's not only about knowledge is moving to the third dimension, which is the spiritual world. Someone talk to me. What does it mean, therefore, to be a spirit? You control the physical from the spiritual. So let me say it nicely. Don't worry about sin. Stop confessing your sins. You're wasting your time. You will not win. That's a physical problem. That's a material problem. You will not succeed. The real business is to get on level three and manage level one. Does that make sense? You want to move to, 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 to the locus of control. Hey, that's English now. You want to go to the aperture of perception. You want to get, ascend from just being a mere physical person to becoming a spiritual person. What am I talking about? Develop the language of the spirit. What does that do for you? You and God in conversation before your mouth can open. You no longer need the law outside. It's now inside. No man needs to tell you what to do. God is now in conversation with you on the inside. Do you want to struggle making decisions? It's no longer a problem. You consult. I didn't say pray. I will help you to pray today. When I say let's pray, don't talk. Paint your picture of God. Who is he? What do you see? Small little white God with blue eyes hanging on a wall. And you are busy sending your requests there. (laughs) 
Really? If you doubt what you know, then look at yourself and start looking at yourself more closely. You will see the God element in you. When you pray, therefore, talk to the one who made you. Have a conversation with him. Meaningful conversations. Meaningful spirituality is to function above elements. Nature obeys. Jesus says greater things than these you will do. But we need the transformation of the human body into a spiritual body. I said it's a work in progress. <laughs> so I don't know how to do that. But we need to collect new, a new group of Christians who are willing to start the journey of meaningful spiritual lives. Not Christian lives. Not denominational people. When we take you for baptism, we are literally taking you to the same waters that which doctors are baptized into. So that they become. They be. So waters of baptism are not just waters of baptism. That is an initiation. And Jesus teaches. You can't enter into the kingdom of heaven unless you are baptized of water and of the spirit. You didn't hear that part there. Guys, do you read the same Bible? Do you read this? Are we reading the same Bible? You, you can't function unless you, have, you go through the waters. And by going through the waters, we're actually initiating the spirit to begin to function inside you. I am tired of physical Christians. I'm tired of those who just want to do, who want to do, who are telling me to do, to do, to do. Stop telling me what to do. Start living. Be what God has intended you to be. I want to challenge all of us to start spiritual journeys. Spiritual lives are not just of food. Take, take moments of isolation, moments of reflection, close the door to the world, think, commune with God, have Him present. Invite him in. If you are scared, then stop being a Christian. But this is what it is all about. But the most beautiful side of the story is that when God is in occupation, your life becomes supernatural. Can I make a call? To supernatural living. Can I make a call? to spiritual living. Can I make a call? Life above things. Can I make a call? To world number three. And we are going to run everything from here. I think I should pray with someone. Amen. Shall we stand together? to put this verse in your, in your spirit for the rest of this week. Hebrews chapter 12. I think Hebrews chapter 12 verses oh, thank you Lord. Verses 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 going down there. Put this verse in your spirit. 
it will transform your life. Around verse 18, that's when it gets real nice. It says, but you have come. Worship time is arrival. You have come. Where have you come? You have come to God. You've come to the church of the firstborn. You've come to the judge of all mankind. You have come together to worship with angels in holy convocation. In other words, moments of worship are not moments of loneliness. You literally must hold hands with angels while you're worshiping. You can close your eyes and transcend to the venue where it is happening. Someone is not with me here. The human body has an ability to move outside of itself and participate at the venue where it is meaningful. What am I talking about? Therefore, when you kneel down to pray, you have a permission to transcend through your mind into the spiritual world and hold hands with the angels and worship in the presence. Are you there? I said 12, chapter 12, you're on 11. You have come. I want to challenge you guys, men. Arrive. Get here. Get here. Get, get here. And when you get there, you will find me there waiting for you and I know by giving this message into your spirit the Lord will unleash gifts power we start operating are you there for you have come unto a mount that can be touched with no fire and blackness just if you grab the whole thing you have come to the venue itself where you don't have to worship in loneliness include God include Yahweh in your worship worship in the presence